So uh, let me introduce myself. My name is Jameis. I am an associate professor in, uh, in the economics department at the French Business School. I am also a, a me member of parliament representing St. Kang DRC. And recently, I got uh, foisted this uh, role of being also the youth wing president, which I am more than happy to do. <laughs> um, so, uh, I am also a voter, uh, like all of you, and I vote in Kabum Baru uh, SMC, which is one of the uh, SMCs around the Amokyo area. So, you can imagine uh, the kind of competition I get. Now, uh, thanks for joining us on a Saturday afternoon. I know that Saturday afternoons is precious time for you to recharge. But nevertheless, uh, I hope that this forum on voting will be valuable to you. Notably, this is a forum on voting for the first time, but uh, not just for first time voters. So what we have uh, in our panel is a number of people that have voted X number of times, we'll leave uh, the specific numbers undeclared to protect people's uh, identities and ages. Um, so what's nice is that this is an opportunity for people to reminisce about their voting experience and just how they think about that. Uh, it, just in terms of structure, what we'll do is we'll start off, I'll get each of our speakers to speak briefly for five minutes on uh, just one thing that they have thought about uh, in the process of voting. We'll, I'll, I'll then have one quick reaction based on what they share. Uh, we'll then open up to questions, both from the floor, and if you sign up, you'll know that you have, many of you have pre-submitted questions, so we'll select uh, from among them. Of course, many of you submitted questions, we're not going to be able to get to every one of them, I apologize, but perhaps if you are eager and uh, have a burning question that you feel needs to be addressed, uh, feel free to try to grab the mic. I can just start us off. Uh, so why voting? From a purely economic point of view, uh, there is actually no reason to vote. Uh, let me explain. Uh, the reason is that, as you know, there's a probability that your vote will matter. You are one out of you know, how many uh, tens of thousands of people that vote. And the probability that your vote actually changes the outcome is very, very minuscule. So, if you think about that, the probability that you will make a difference, you will probably say, well, given the time that it takes, the hot sun, standing in lines, there's absolutely no reason why I should vote. Of course, there's one good reason in Singapore to vote, and that is that it's compulsory. So that is one way uh, to get around this, but hopefully uh, this forum will also, through the sharing of our panelists, explain why there are other reasons why you should care about uh, your vote and why it matters. So let me uh, start us off. I will uh, maybe get, uh, let me introduce uh, our panelists and I'll do them one at a time and then get them to share before moving on to the next one. So this handsome gentleman here, he, his name is Christian. Uh, he's currently a first year university student and is interested in developments in the aviation industry. That was all he gave me. Uh, <laughs> I pre presume he wanted to keep himself, but I, I will happily say that I think he's also a single uh, young man. Yes, so additional juicy tidbits for all of y'all. Okay, so I'm gonna hand the mic over to Christian for him to share. Okay, so wow. this is my first time hearing my voice on the mic, uh, so <laughs> it feels a bit weird, but uh, single but not ready to mingle yet. So. <laughs> So uh, hello everyone, my name is uh, Christian, you can just call me Chris. So I'm born in 2001, so I'm 23 this year. So uh, yeah, I'm just, I'm a, as uh, James mentioned, I'm a first year student at uh, NUS, uh, FAST, uh, FASS to be exact. So um, this is my first time voting in a general election. Last year I voted in the presidential election. Um, as, far, uh, as far as my experience is concerned, it was actually very uh, efficient and very smooth. I mean, thanks to the, you know, all the civil servants and all the teachers who you know, had to sacrifice their teacher's day just to you know, make it happen. So, uh, but anyway, compared to a presidential election, I felt that uh, with a general election, 
there is a greater emphasis on uh, policy matters and we and we and through that we uh, we have a greater hand we have a greater uh, we have a greater hand in determining the government's direction for the next uh, few years. So um, with this in mind, my considerations at the ballot box for the general election would be to vote according to my to my principles and my values and what I hope for Singapore to be in the future. And um, for me personally, I hope that Singapore would be much more egalitarian and I hope that my candidate would, um, would, would uh, pursue such uh, would, would, t would go down a path that uh, helps to support that uh, ideal. And um, I think I would, like, I would like to think that there's a sim there's a there's a sizable block of voters, especially those around my age, who would feel that way as well. And um, after all, I mean, we were the generation that uh, grew up with, you know, uh, the global financial. My my parents experienced the the two thousand eight uh, global financial crisis. My uh, we experienced COVID, and we are also gonna deal with the effects of climate change. So I think that we are that uh, at least it, uh, those voters my age, uh, some voters my age and myself included, would hope for a government that would be able to effectively address these issues uh, when, when we go to the polls uh, in the next uh, general election. Uh. Wonderful, thank you. <laughs> Let me introduce the next uh, member of our panel, uh, Muntasin. He is a product specialist for a car maker, and he has a deep interest in current affairs and geopolitics. He tends to dabble in photography on the site. This sounds a bit like a dating profile. Uh, <laughs> now, uh, I will let him go on and share his thoughts about uh, his voting experience. Hi, folks. I'm Bokdasin, and uh, as Jim has mentioned, uh, I'm quite interested in geopolitics and current affairs which also is the reason why I'm here today talking to all of you and with this great uh, panel here. So my experience uh, has been uh, more of a like, vote about two times, one general election and one presidential election. So this year will be my third time uh, as a voter. My, uh, I would say that my uh, expectations for the the elections or voting who the right candidate is lies solely on like what they offer to the table. Um, I am not really the one who is easily uh, affected by the emotional strings that are being pulled. Um, that's why I'm not really interested in like very populist policies. But at the same time, I would like to have the, the policies and, and uh, promises resonate with my personal values. And uh, therefore, it's very important that uh, I make the right choice. Now, even though, as I said, voting um, doesn't have a, doesn't make a big, big impact on the, the final results, I still feel that it is uh, our duty and it's a way for our voices to be heard by the incumbent. So, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's a very interesting, Balance you know, when you when you put your or rather when you cast your your vote in the ballot box, um, it is a way to tell the incumbent, look, I like what you're doing, or I don't like what you're doing, without getting off mark. It's simple as that. <laughs> so that is where you can see whether, uh, or rather, the incumbent can see whether oh we are doing the right thing or oh we have a lot of things to improve on. So it's a, it's a valid it's, it's a valid way to express ourselves um, away from the social media pages, away from uh, maybe voicing your your expressing your discontent in a in a public area. It's it's legal. It's compulsory. So why not? That's all I can share for now. Thank you. Thanks, Matthew.
All right, next in line, we have Sylvia. Sylvia's message to me about her bio was, you make it up. So uh, here I am making up her bio. Uh, she, so Vo Sylvia, of course, uh, is a veteran of, uh, in politics. She joined in 2001. Uh, so she has seen through many elections. Uh, she is currently the chairwoman of the Workers' Party. And of course, uh, she is deeply acquainted also with uh, voters, voting rules, and so on, uh, to the extent that whenever we are confused about standing orders in Parliament, she is our go-to person. So uh, it's perhaps from that deep well of knowledge that we tap on now that I invite her to share some thoughts. Okay, good afternoon everyone. Thanks, Jameis. So, um, as you can see, you know, uh, I've had some voting experience. Uh, but then in the history of uh, Singapore's politics, you'd be surprised because uh, there were quite a number of general elections where uh, uh, we faced walkovers, you know. Today, you would be surprised if any constituency is uncontested, which is a very healthy thing. But this was not always the case, you know, and in fact, one of the reasons why I joined WP in 2001, okay, which is 23 years ago, was that in that particular election, two-thirds of the seats were not contested. It's hard for us to imagine this, an election that's focused on just one-third of the seats, but that used to happen. So we should not take you know, the right to vote for granted because uh, it requires people to contest. Uh, and I'm so glad that Mutazin has rebutted Jameis on uh, why it is, is not, uh, it's still worthwhile to vote. Uh, and for my part, I'll just add that, uh, you know, in, in general, people vote for two reasons. One is to achieve a particular outcome. That means maybe you'd like to emplace uh, a, a member of parliament or change a member of parliament. That is instrumental voting. But there's also uh, voting to send a message, which I think you articulate so well. I don't have to um, emphasize on that. And every party always looks at percentages. So whether we win or lose, we will see oh, did we do better or not than the last time? What could be the reason and so on? And I can tell you the ruling party looks at this very seriously. So please uh, do not devalue the chance to vote. Okay, it's, it's hard to come by and we of course uh, have also the political parties to thank for giving us the opportunity to vote. Okay, so um, James asked us actually to share uh, our first voting experience uh, and I, I want to share this because I don't want you all to make the same mistake that I made. Some of you look like you have voted before. Okay? No offence to the way but, but some of you may be voting for the first time and, and the procedures might intimidate you for the wrong reason and I just want to touch on that. Uh, from my first experience voting in 1991, um, way before most of you were born I think. Okay, so at that time, uh, I was in between jobs uh, because I had applied to join the police force and you know to join any civil service department there's a whole procedure of interviews and it takes months for you to finally get uh, accepted. So when the election was called I was in the process of going through these interviews and uh, at that time the mood in Singapore was actually quite I would say uh, politically alive you know and you, you would know if you look at the results of that election in 1991, that was the election where four opposition MPs were elected, which in Singapore's history was a great, uh, almost a tidal wave, even though it's just four seats, because we never had that before. It was always J.B. Jaratnam alone, and then maybe one more person, you know, Mr. Chiam, and then suddenly four people. So, so the mood was like that. Uh, so anyway, I, I had made up my mind, you know, uh, to do my part for democracy, so I, I went to vote. When I arrived at the voting uh, station, the election officers did what they were supposed to do, meaning they have to call out your number and your name loudly, okay? And the reason they do that is there are polling agents at the side who will kind of mark attendance to make sure that there's no like person coming back to vote again, you know? Uh, so so it's, and it's in accordance with the Parliamentary Elections Act. But then when I was standing there hearing my full name called out, Lin Sui Lian, Sylvia, you know, this number, I don't know why, but a sense of panic came over me. You know, it's just the moment that, oh my goodness, you know, I'm at the cusp of doing something that might affect me personally. And um, because of the panic that I had, thinking, oh my goodness, maybe I cannot get accepted into the police force, you know, something might happen, I, you know, and my job uh, prospects would be ruined. So I caved in to my fear 
and I went in there and I voted for the PAP. Now, I, I, I'm not revealing this for the first time. This is not news. Okay, I've written about this in the past. You know, but I, when I analyze that back, first of all, I'm ashamed. You know, and secondly, it, it also reflects a certain lack of confidence in me at that time about ballot secrecy, which none of you should have because over all these years, you know, in my um, work with the party, we have always made sure that at the end of the counting process, you know, that the ballot boxes are sealed, you know, we sign on it and it is transported to the Supreme Court vault by Gurkhas. And then six months later, we go there to retrieve the boxes for incineration and we know that the seals are all intact. So, some people sometimes have this query about, oh, you know, there are serial numbers and things like that. But I'm very confident, in fact, the party has been putting out a lot of information on this, that voting is a secret. So, you should not have any fear in your mind. You just vote for whoever you want. Okay, this is our right as citizens, and, and I think we shouldn't take that for granted. So, maybe that's what I'd share for now. Thank you, Sylvia. So, on that very emphatic note, uh, I can now welcome our final panelist. So, Jackson, he works in communications and is now uh, with one of uh, what is now one of the world's largest market infrastructure and data companies. He also contributes to the grassroots effort in Serangoon and serves as uh, on the party's media team and youth wing. So he's part of uh, our establishment, if you will. Uh, and personally, he is also very interested in history and political theory. So perhaps small wonder why he has uh, gotten involved. So I will leave it to him to share his thoughts. Hi, everyone. Yeah. Um, thank you all for coming today, firstly. It's really good to see all of you all. Um, my name is Jackson, and maybe I'll just start by saying I'm a borderline young person. Uh, I voted in two general elections before, so maybe that kind of qualifies me to talk about youth voting today. Um, but I think really why I'm here is just to make up numbers and also not let Sylvia feel so bad and out of place here. <laughs> <laughs> but in all, in all seriousness, um, I think we'll discuss many uh, interesting and important topics on this panel today. But the key thing, and just to show you that it's not scripted at all, the key thing that I would like you to leave here with is that your vote uh, is very important. It's so valuable and it's so important in, in determining everything um, about this country and how you live. And to really illustrate this point, I, I have to go back to the last, just after the last general election, when I read then Prime Minister Lee Sen Lung's uh, remarks about free riders, which was a term he used to refer to people who voted against the PAP establishment. Um, notwithstanding how disparaging this term is to the almost 40% of Singaporeans that voted, did not vote for the PAP, it also seems to suggest that a vote against the establishment is uh, emblematic of some kind of systemic failure in democracy. So I find this perspective quite flawed and inherently problematic. And if I may be uh, less politically correct, I was thinking at the time that the Prime Minister really can talk up. <laughs> so why, why is it so important? Why is your vote so important? Why is it so valuable? And it really stresses the point that Sylvia and uh, Mo um, shared just now, in that your vote sends a message. It sends a message. Uh, it determines the political capital that the government has. It, it shows the direction that their policies will take, and it dictates how they engage with you as a member of the electorate. And you can make no mistake about it. A PAP government with 70, 75% of the popular vote, with multiple constituencies walked over, will behave extremely differently than a PAP government with sub-60% of the vote, vote share, and uh, with a strong and loyal opposition constantly checking and balancing against it. It will behave very differently. Then you see this at the national level, you see this at the constituency level, on the national level, you have seen uh, policy shifts in uh, and policy shifts in directions of certain policies where they put forward ideas that they said were previously untenable. And on the local level, uh, for those of you that live in that are fortunate enough to live in uh, constituencies that are uh, politically competitive, you may find that your MP or your grassroots advisor is just a bit more hardworking. They are a bit more committed to reaching out to you. They are work, working a bit harder to be more visible and to earn your vote and to earn your Earn your, earn your support. And I think this is the hallmark of how a democracy should be, where your votes are not just counted, but they're also earned. So with that, I think that's a 
that's pretty much what I want to share about I, what the takeaway for today is. Um, but yeah, I look forward to discussing more with my panel. Thank you. Christian, you mentioned that you have, there's a greater emphasis on policy matters uh, in the context of a GE. So, if I may, what are the sorts of policies that uh, you think people should be thinking about? Should they be perhaps more single-minded, um, one-issue voters? Or do, should they try to actually filter uh, and absorb all that vast array of information that is out there that, that, uh, before they decide on the vote? And how do they do that, given that there's so much information? Okay, so, um, I think I'll, it's, actually it's my voice, uh, can, can hear, okay, sorry, I think I just, <laughs> I sound, I'm sorry, I really sound weird in the, in the mind, I, I feel weird. <laughs> so, bas uh, basically, uh, okay, I, I would like to say that firstly, whether you are a single issue voter, or if you are, uh, you know, you consider a myriad of issues, either way, it's valid, that's how I feel, and, um, because, I mean, I read, different people have, uh, you know, their different life experiences, they have the different things that they value, and, and I don't think, personally, I don't think I should dictate what each person should consider when they go to the polls. Yeah. Okay, wonderful. Thanks, Christian. Uh, so just to shake things up a little bit, maybe I can go to Jackson at the other end of the couch. Uh, you mentioned that there is a value of the vote, and the value is truly in sending a message, whether explicit or implicit, about political capital and so on. Uh, of course, there's a lot of rumors that uh, one, we could be going into uh, a new general election cycle soon. We don't actually know if you guys have any insider information, feel free to share. Um, but maybe that, nevertheless, it must be called uh, by law by uh, November of next year. So that's just the, the hard deadline in which it has to be called. So obviously, we will be thinking about the kind of issues that would matter, would, that you think are important in election matters. And in our discussions with, in, during our house visits, when we talk to uh, Singaporeans, we certain ones emerge. So I'm wondering, perhaps, Jackson, you can share with us what you think uh, is, firstly, your most, the, the most important issues for you, and what you think uh, are important issues that Singaporeans should be thinking about. Sure. Uh, thanks, James. Thanks, Christian. Um, I think if I can start to answer this question, right, I'd like to share a political quote, which goes something like this. Uh, if you're not a liberal when you're young, you have no heart. If you're not conservative when you're older, uh, you have no brain. Uh, so that's how that quote goes. Um, it kind of suggests that there is, there is this um, binary or transgression of what matters to you when, when, as you age and as you, as you grow as part of the group. I, I think that there is some truth to it, but really the issues that were important to me when I started voting, which is you know, uh, political balance, uh, strong position, check and balance of government, they still matter to me now, uh, but there are other, there are other considerations. Sorry, there are other considerations that I factor into my decision, uh, such as you know, uh, what will my what will my future be in uh, in my career in my career of choice? Uh, will house prices be you know affordable for me, uh, or even my my future children? These are some of the considerations that, that factor into my decision making. I think the government realized this as well at the last general election. Um, first time voters like my good friend Kristen here only comprise 10% of the electorate. So you might think, oh 10% of me, not much, it doesn't really change the needle, it uh, doesn't really move the needle as much. But you have to keep in mind that that 10% will soon become middle aged voters, they will soon start uh, working, they will start having their jobs, uh, they will start having families and they will start owning properties and that is the kind of consideration that you have uh, to engage uh, people. You, it doesn't just change because of how old or how young you are. So that's what I will I would add to that conversation if Great. Thanks, Jackson. Uh, well, I, I tend to lean, lean liberal, so uh, here is a comment from someone with no brain. Uh, <laughs> but let me go on to Mutasim. Uh, he he met you mentioned earlier on about policies and promises and how they should resonate with values. Now that's a really laden word, and um, you also emphasize how we should 
voters should feel that they are expressing themselves uh, with casting their ballot. Uh, in all fairness, I, I mentioned earlier on that one economic approach to voting is that it doesn't make a difference, so you should not vote. But there is, to be fair, a literature on expressive voting uh, that talks about how uh, that gives you meaning and that's why you should actually go ahead and vote. So, on that, uh, is the expression actually best made by voting via some kind of party identity or religious identity or uh, some kind of philosophical identity should we be consider or should we be considering uh, the specific characteristics of each individual that is standing on the ballot uh, when they go about uh, during election time thanks James for the question um, I I think that when it comes to voting for the right one for you the one that resonates with your your values I think this is not specific to the, the party member that is contesting, but the party as a whole. Because the party as a whole usually has the same, same set of values, same set of opinions, same set of approach uh, towards uh, issues. So when we look at, um, for example, uh, freedom of speech, I mean, you have Okma, the one I mentioned earlier on, or when we look at religious issues like um, the, the Tudong issue um, from a few years ago where Mr. Faisal Banak had championed for a long time. Um, we saw a lot of party support, um, even if they were not sharing, uh, even if they were not uh, of the same race or religion, uh, even if they, they had other, other thoughts. When it came to presenting a, a front, they were very united. And I think that's very important. Um, and, and when you see all these values go in line with yours, I think that is when you know this is the right person, or rather this is the right party to vote. Yeah, so that's, okay, that's it. great, thank you. All right, last but certainly not least, uh, Sylvia, you mentioned earlier on that when you first were involved in politics, you uh, that two thirds of the seats uh, were actually not contested. So, literally on the day that the election was called, uh, not not on the day the election was called, the nomination day closed, uh, you would know which who the government is. Uh, of course, part of the reason for this was because of uh, some stand, uh, understanding that many people have of the challenges uh, of standing on an opposition ticket. Uh, and this is one of the submitted questions as well. So, uh, given this background, why, why do you think anyone would ever want to join the opposition? What, or you can share why you decided to join the opposition, or you can share both of them. Thanks, Jameis. Okay, in 2001, um, which was the election which I mentioned had two-thirds of walkovers, it wasn't so much about uh, people not wanting to join the opposition, but the fact that they didn't have time to prepare. Okay, so uh, if, if you, those of you who are alive at the time will recall, okay, uh, what had happened was that there were the 911 attacks in New York. Uh, and um, so what happened in Singapore was that the PP government decided that they would call, kind of call a snap election. Okay, so the previous election was in, uh, let me see, 1997, so 2001, it's okay. But uh, so what had happened was that the boundaries, uh, which are always redrawn before the election, right? They were released, and shortly after that, the election was called. So basically, the, the other parties didn't have time to prepare, uh, and, and that led to what's one of the contributing reasons, as far as I could remember, uh, why uh, two-thirds of the seats was not contested. And coming back to James's question, that actually was the impetus for me to join WP, because I'm a believer in democracy, what's and all. And I was telling myself that if this trend is going to continue and we're going to have elections with just you know one third, one quarter of the seats contested, it's not meaningful for Singaporeans. And therefore, how are we going to make it more meaningful? We have to participate. So that was to me the compelling reason. And I told myself, no more procrastination. You can see the, the writing on the wall. You just have to do it because you will regret it if you don't take action now. 
It, and I think many of you may have this similar experience, like, say when you're watching an election, you get really fired up and wow, okay, yes, we want to change the world and all that. But after the election's over, if you don't act on it, right, about a year later, you'll probably be back to your normal, same old routine and then that opportunity or that passion is not harnessed. So, so that was actually the impetus uh, for me to join because I wanted to defend Singapore's democracy, which I felt was at the risk of backsliding really badly. Um, of course, the bigger question as to why people join even though um, the path is probably not simple. I'm not saying that joining the PAP is simple because I've never joined them, but um, you know, I think if you were to talk to your parents about wanting to join WP, for example, they would ask you some questions, right? You know, Because it's kind of uncertain. You're going down a path that is not well trodden. There are some risks along the way. So each person has to ask themselves, what they want to do with their lives, right? I mean, okay, so some people, and I can fully understand, they have, maybe, uh, maybe people who depend on them. So they have to work uh, to earn a decent salary to support the people that depend on them. That's perfectly respectable and understandable. Okay, but there are other people who, who are wired differently. They, they want to make a contribution to society um, and they want to push boundaries, you know, because they think that that would benefit uh, fellow Singaporeans. So I believe that many of my party members have this motivation. Of course, some of them hate the PAP, but we hope that that's not the reason because it's not sustainable to have negative feelings. You must have intrinsic motivation that you think you would like to be part of this organization because you can make a difference and it is important to you to at least do it so that you won't look back with regret. So I think many people are wired this way. Are you not, Jameis? <laughs> Thankfully, I'm not a panel panelist, so I will de decline to answer this. But uh, I have been known to be weird by my friends, and still I'm, I'm known to be weird by my friends. Now, uh, I want to give an opportunity for us now to open up to questions from the floor, so that we actually get a little bit more of a conversation going. Uh, there is a little mic here uh, that will be circulated. So, uh, if you have any questions, uh, feel free. Uh, hi, uh, good afternoon. Uh, I'm not young, but I'm young at heart. <laughs> and what's your name? Sorry, I should uh, have said you should just, uh, just say who you are. You can call me Dan. Okay. Yeah. Okay, my question is, uh, is Singapore ready to become more democratic, such as have more opposition in parliament, uh, have an independent press, uh, public demonstrations? Uh, how would more democracy affect Singapore stability and foreign investor sentiments. Okay, great, wonderful. So, uh, panelists, so there, there are, Jackson, go ahead. There, there, there are a few part, if I may just repeat the question, there are a few parts to that. Uh, one about just the democratic process, and then subsequently also the implications, if it were to have a freer press and so on, what that could potentially mean for uh, the country's economic progress. I'll just stress the point on uh, more democratic processes. So, the economic strategy uh, in its latest classification, I think it classifies Singapore as a flawed democracy. Uh, I will speak to what extent I think that those flaws will do. So, you have to remember that for Singapore, right? Sorry. Excellent. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Um, sorry, as I was saying, I will speak to what extent I think those flaws will do. So you have to remember, right, that Singapore, uh, we have the, the second longest political party still in governance, I think just behind the Communist Party of China. And we talk about democracy and making progress and greater representation in parliament. Um, I think the MPs know this as well. After everything is done and dusted, we still only have eight uh, MPs seated in parliament, making less than 10% of the vote share. And I did a bit of off-the-cuff uh, research before I joined this panel. And it's not an official statistic per se, but when you look at uh, MPs per capita, I think we have one of the fewest uh, MPs per capita anywhere in the world compared to other major parliamentary democracies. We have something like 60,000 people to each MP in, in uh, Singapore. So I do wonder why our, legislature, um, why our legislature is the way it is and whether this talk of more democracy will, will help it. I certainly think it will, but at this moment, I, I think there are a lot of uh, issues that we need to address um, for, si for Singapore before we, before we go to the other points you mentioned about uh, foreign investment and, and uh, 
uh, civic freedoms. Would any of my panelists care to add on? Um, maybe I'll just address um, some assumption in your question, which, which is sometimes the message that we seem to hear from the officials, and that is that Singapore needs to compromise on individual freedoms in order for us to uh, do well economically and to be a safe country. You always hear this uh, message being touted out. Um, and I just like to point out that uh, okay, there is this um, rule of law ranking that the government relies on all the time, done by the World Freedom Project. And if you look at the, the rankings on um, order and security, okay, you'll find that Singapore, of course, does quite well. But if you look at the top 10 countries, right, many of them are like Nordic countries, you know, Scandinavian countries, Ireland, and so on, which tells me that uh, uh, people can be secure in a country which has individual freedoms as well. Okay, so it, it's not that it's a, a, a binary choice, you either choose this or that, but actually there's much more room for us to move in, in, in that direction as well. So, I mean, it could be related to your foreign investment question because basically businesses like certainty, so I suppose having an orderly society with political stability is good for business, but it just also highlights the point that the two are not mutually exclusive. Thanks for the question, Dan. Um, okay, let me zoom in on your question regarding um, the media, uh, about press freedom, and how it affects like democracy here. So I feel that, like what Sylvia said, it's not mutually beneficial, or rather it's not mutually exclusive for Singapore to progress and still have a, a free press. So right now what we are seeing in Singapore is that your newspapers, your online publications, they all have a single voice and it's all straight from the government's press release department. So what you read from one newspaper will look exactly the same on the next newspaper, just with a few words changed here and there. So I feel that right now it doesn't inspire critical thinking to the reader because what you are re reading is essentially uh, glorified press releases there are, no, uh, there are no alternative uh, perspectives to a single uh, topic. So it can be about um, public transport, it can be about uh, a certain national policy that was just being passed in Parliament. What we need right now is, is uh, a difference in opinion and it should be widely available, therefore, that's where your press comes in. Uh, right now, it's very hard to to achieve that because uh, the government has such a stronghold in, in what is being published. But I believe that if you change, if you have, uh, you have more uh, alternative voices out there, we can still stand to benefit because the citizens feel more engaged. They feel that they have a stake in, in, in the issue. And right now, uh, we are seeing that change. It's very small because there are a lot of barriers that, that the incumbent has put up um, to, to prevent you from speaking out too much, too loudly. Uh, but I feel that if we were to remove those barriers, we can still progress as a nation, we can still be very successful, but at the same time, we can still stand to benefit from a much more uh, politically aware um, society. Yeah, um, I think just to build on uh, Mutasin's point, um, with regards to, to journalism and the press, so, uh, first, I mean, there's this thing uh, where, you know, if let's say you, I think it's called access journalism, I might be wrong, I'm so sorry, but um, basically if uh, the press publishes something that is um, sort of goes against the, uh, or hurts the feelings of the newsmakers, like for example, that might be the government, or that it might be you know very important people, uh, they will not be able to gain access to this uh, these important sources of news that people want to hear. And but the thing is, from what I kind of understand, I might be wrong. Uh, there are you know many young journalists out there who really want to whether in the alternative media or in the mainstream media who actually want to you know to be a to 
function as a check and balance against the government and important people to hold them to account. So uh, I think that you know there is there's a little hope. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Wonderful. Uh, just a quick fact check. Uh, as a moderator, uh, the the longest standing. Uh, political party is actually not uh, from China, it is from North Korea. <laughs> uh, and, and notably, it is the Workers' Party of North Korea. Uh, no affiliation. So ju just a quick point. And, and the, in fact, there are quite a few that... Uh, the PAP is the, long, the longest standing one from uh, a... In continuous uh, from a democratic, nominally the democratic system. A self-actualized woman, if they are. <laughs> I'm actualized every day, let me tell you this. <laughs> and sometimes I wonder to myself, why did I, uh, you know, what, what's next? Um, I mean, just to share, you know, when I was at a new university, uh, I did notice that Maslow's hierarchy playing out in the sense that I had friends who were very poor. Okay, and they had no time to really look into some of these bigger issues that some of us were, were worried about, you know, uh, because they, they, they were preoccupied with um, graduating from law school so that they could lift their families out of poverty. I mean, that was foremost in their minds, and I really respect that because they were very single-minded about it. Um, and I used to have endless arguments with my father during this period of time. Because he, he was always telling me, you know, if you were living in other circumstances, you'd be more focused. And I said, I agree. It's your fault. We are middle class. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you see, so when, when someone is comfortable, I mean, you know, you're looking at the hierarchy, you've, you've got your basic needs done, then you tend to look for meaning because you, you yearn for the human existence to have something better than just an animal kind of existence, right? So, so... Uh, but your question is quite a difficult one because you're saying how do we actually get voters to think in this way, right? Um, we've never thought of it uh, as that because I think in general political parties in Singapore don't think about how we can get voters to feel self-actualized because everyone is at a, has different priorities, right? So we tend to focus more on, on, on convincing people why a vote for our party is more meaningful for your life and your children's life. So in that sense, it's probably the closest we can ever get to, to that kind of, I would say, principle or idealism. But we don't usually phrase it in, in those terms. For me, it's simpler. There's a simpler reason why I cannot be self-actualized, because I'm still poor. But uh, <laughs> So uh, anyone else would like to step in? Otherwise, we can always take another question. Yeah, go ahead. Ask you. Hi, I'm Horatio. Um, I think back when I was a first-time voter at the last election, that was a very popular but also slightly dangerous view that um, we should vote for the opposition no matter what. Um, and so as part of that perspective, I wanted to ask a couple of questions. Um, the first one is, how do we determine the minimum bar that the opposition should meet in order to vote for that? And the other question is, what if we want opposition voices in parliament, but we feel that the incumbent will serve our needs better directly as members of parliament for our ward? Ah, oh, the free rider question again. <laughs> okay, uh, anyone wants to pick this up? Um, I'll try, because this really resonates uh, with me, Horatio. Again, I really need to emphasize that the PP has been in power for almost, um, the, not almost, the entirety of Singapore's independence. This is a government, right, that has pushed out rhetoric that Oh, at the next general election, if too many people vote for the opposition, then there could be a coalition of opposition and the PAP will not be in government and, and all this. And I really, have to, I really have to bring the facts to the table, right, in that after everything is done and dusted, we still have eight MPs in parliament. You know, we're so far away from touching the... the from, from, we're so far away from touching government, right? We, we should really focus, as uh, Pritam says, on breaking the PAP's... Uh, Super majority in the first instance. I think when we get to that stage, then we can talk about, oh yeah, this might happen in the future, uh, if there's a change in, in government. The other thing I would like to emphasize is that, you know, a change uh, in government, not that I'm advocating for it um, or anything, but it's not necessarily a bad thing or, 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 it's not necessarily a bad thing. And I 
take us to the recent UK elections where Labour won after 14 years of uh, Tory leadership. And you know, you could argue that. You could argue, depending on where you sit on the political spectrum, but I would think it, it is a sign that a democracy works when leadership can change and new policies can come in place to suit the electorate of a uh, country. That's what I'll add to that, Rachel. Yeah, you, you look like you're uh, winding up. <laughs> yeah, so I personally, I don't subscribe to uh, this rhetoric that, oh, if you were to vote opposition, the country will fall the next day. That is, it's scary stuff, and they have phrased it for that very reason, is to scare you into not voting for opposition. Okay, I've, I've talked about um, how voting for, for your, your preferred candidate is based on your values, but you should also not be swayed by, by the, the boogeyman that, that uh, the KP is like, um, hovering in front of you. We, we shouldn't be scared of that. Uh, in fact, if you look at other countries, they have thriving economies, they have very successful societies, even with a multi-party system with uh, an almost equal balance of, from either side. So, yes, PAP has been successful in bringing the economy up over the past few decades. That we cannot deny. But we cannot subscribe to the to the theory that without PAP, everything just dies off immediately. So that is where we need to we need to be a bit braver and and realize that if the other candidates have very sound policies, very good um, alternative uh, alternative solutions to a problem, then we shouldn't be afraid to to cast the vote on that rather than incumbent. Uh, and I think like what we said as well uh, earlier on, casting that vote will inspire the incumbent to work a little bit harder, regardless of whether uh, on polling day they win or lose. If the gap narrows down, they will work harder. That is fact. We have seen it before. Um, I have seen it in my, my uh, estate. Um, so it, it's good to, to get your, your representative to, to be a bit more hardworking, that that's the way that your tax dollar works. So I think my question might have been slightly unclear. I think what I was getting at was that if you wanted to vote opposition because you saw the importance of it, but you felt the opposition that was contesting your ward was quite incompetent, then how would you go about with that? Because right? that's all incompetent or maybe not directly aligned with the values that you hold. Yeah, sorry. That was I question. think each voter has to decide for himself or herself how to do that calculation. Um, and I can just share a range of reactions that I've received, you know. I have a friend, such a dear friend, he, he told me, you know, he will always vote for the opposition candidate because he does not want that person to lose his deposit. Now, I think that's very profound. It's very profound because if you get, you know, less than 12.5% of the votes or something, you lose your deposit. And it's for about $14,000. You know, this person is coming up with this money to give you a chance to vote. He lost his deposit because maybe he wasn't a strong candidate, you know, but so so this this voter, my friend, told me that he always has this in mind that I don't want this person to lose deposit because this person is playing an important role uh, in, in the system. Then you have other people who say, uh, I, I recognize that we need more opposition, but I cannot vote for this person or I cannot vote for this team, you know, so I'm gonna spoil my vote. You, you, you know, uh, you know, or, or or some people just think, okay, la, look. Uh, on balance, objectively, the PP team is better, I'll vote for PP. So each voter has their own calculation of what's important to them and how they uh, would react in that kind of scenario. Uh, we have a question over here. Yeah. Hello. Uh, very nice to hear all your sharing so far. I'm Fadila. Uh, third time voter, I think. <laughs> um, I had a question uh, that was sparked by what uh, Jackson, one of Jackson's comments earlier on liberal and conservative versus conservative. Um, I find that dichotomy, we often hear about it in other countries' politics, so especially the US now coming to election, we hear about liberals versus um, conservatives. Um, I'm wondering what that tra dichotomy translates into for Singapore. Is that a useful categorization that we would use for Singapore's spectrum of politics? And if it's not, 
as useful to think about our voters in this way? What could be a framework that would be more useful um, to think about the various spectrum of voters? Yeah, thanks. Thanks for a very deep question. Is the left-right divide the right way to think about uh, local politics, or is it something else? <laughs> don't, don't all rush to the mic. <laughs> I don't personally subscribe. That's not my quote. It's just something that has existed yes, in, in the past. Um, I think, again, really, it really depends on, on where you are. Some people care more about bread and butter issues. Some people care more about um, the ideological, the philosophical angle. Um, for me personally, the issues that, that made me vote the way I did, sorry, the issues that made me vote the way I did you know, two generations ago are still resonate with me and they're still very important to me. But Factoring into my thinking now, I you know I do have to look at um, you know bread and butter issues. Can I get good jobs? Can I get a, a good home like my parents did? Can I uh, build a future for my my children? So that's what practice in my thinking. But maybe James, you can also uh, add. Something no, no, I have no thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, uh, But maybe Christian, you have some thoughts about the left-right divide, or no, okay, okay, and. Anyone else? Left, right, divide? Is that uh, relevant in Singapore? I, I would say that uh, among the older generation, I do not sense that they think this way. Um, but of course, maybe we don't talk about left and right, but we have certain maybe leanings towards like, do we believe generally that people should be self-reliant? We should reward talent. We, you know, we must keep taxes very low. You know, which is more of a right uh, spectrum type of thinking, or, or there are people who think no. As a society, we must move together. We cannot have too much inequality. You know, and therefore we tend to move towards the left. So although we we don't really use those words, but but I think instinctively each of us leans more to the left or more to the right. You know, and at this point, I, I I was reminded of this book which I which I read some years ago, and I read very few books. But this this book was um, written by this senator who has just passed away, U.S. senator called um, Joe Lieberman. And what he says is that, as politicians too, you know, we may start off on the left or on the right, but when it comes to taking part in elections and wanting to be elected, you'll see people moving towards the middle because you need you know, the support that will push you over the line. So we, I think each have our starting points, whatever we call it, you know, but in the end, um, I think extreme positions are, are not going to have traction with the general population. I guess the only other point I would just add to that, I can't believe this, uh, <laughs> is that what may be uh, left in one society could actually be a little bit to the right in another, right? So it's often said, that uh, the slightly left or center Democrats in the US uh, will probably be on the right of the spectrum in, in Europe. So it really does uh, depend on the society in question. Like there are so many perspectives and like, policies to consider, right, as a first time voter. So, how of you here have voted yourself many times? And so the question is what are the two most important things you take into consideration as a voter yourself? Okay, I'm not going to let you off, Christian. So you, you at least uh, have to have some thoughts about, for yourself, what are the two most important? Uh, yes. Uh, first, okay. I think first hand, um, general, generally, I, uh, sorry, how may I address, how may I address you? Swan. Okay, thank you, Swan, for the question. Um, I think, firstly, I'd like to look at what, I, I mean, uh, as, someone who is very much exposed to, you know, social media and all that, I think I gained a deeper understanding of the plight of the marginalized in Singapore and what they go through. So, um, in this, so in that sense, I will, you know, I hope that, uh, with this in mind, I hope that, you know, the government, firstly, the government would, you know, do much more to, you know, ensure uh, a much more Eco society, and uh, second and secondly, um, I mean, we we have seen um, recently there was a lot there's a lot more uh, uh, expressions of uh, public expressions um, like you know uh, public demonstrations at uh, graduation ceremonies and all that. 
So I hope that you know there would be you know there is a there is a demand for a great greater freedom of speech in Singapore, and I hope that you know uh, in the uh, uh, you know at the elections I hope that the gov the government would at least um, help to cultivate an environment that would enable uh, personally myself to uh, express myself. Yeah. Thank you. Two issues in government? Yeah. Okay, so I usually vote with two things in mind. First is how the party or the parties have conducted themselves over the past few years. So this is like a, a report card for them. So if the party, let's, for example, let's put the incumbent uh, in the spotlight as they always have, which is that if they have uh, spent maybe excessive amounts of money for a lot of vanity projects, um, they have not, if they have not solved issues that have, uh, that, that the general population has faced, maybe like rising prices in transport, um, housing prices that are becoming a lot more uh, unattainable, if they are unable to solve all these critical matters, how should we be confident in voting for them? So this is something that I keep in mind every time I'm at the ballot box. So again, this is not about um, moving towards uh, populist policies, but it's about asking yourself whether I want to spend another five years with a party that has maybe let me down, maybe have made my life harder. Do you really want that? Or do you want to look at the other, the other solution, or rather the other option? Which leads me to the second point, which is uh, the feasibility of how the policies are being uh, presented by the different parties. So I can simply vote for a party that promises me the world, but if they are unable to to show like a very sound explanation of how they will achieve that in the five years, then I would have, if they are able to do that, then of course I'll have more confidence, then I would strongly consider them rather than the incumbent. But if they give me like a lot of like very general, very superficial uh, explanations without going deep into it, if they don't have like a team of economists, hello Jesus, <laughs> um, if they don't have a um, team of economists or like experienced lawmakers or even people who are uh, experts in their fields, then of course I would have um, my doubts. Then I would be a lot less uh, confident, a lot less uh, inspired to have them on board to represent me uh, in Parliament. So those are my two considerations. Thank you. I don't know about team of economists, but I rely on my, my, my team of uh, lawyers and accountants to make sure that, uh, that we stay out of jail. Uh, now, uh, see, now I, I'm going to switch gears to one of the user submitted questions. Uh, I, I thought this was interesting. Now, just to be clear, people submitted a lot of questions. Some of them uh, tend to have more of a flavor of what would WP do kind of thing. I want to keep this more general along the lines of uh, voter or voter considerations, uh, especially for you. So this I found very interesting. And th the question is that since 2020, the PAP has been aggressively targeting the youth vote with a sponsored media content and influencer engagement. Uh, for example, Friends of the PAP that many of you may have heard of. Uh, two of potential candidates, uh, one of them, uh, Professor Elmi, uh, who arguably will contest in Sinkang and uh, Professor Chen, who arguably will contest in Tampines, uh, research the effects of media on youths. So the question is, what are some challenges in engaging the under 25 uh, voting bloc without resorting to, um, this is the person, so I didn't say this, uh, gimmicks or superficial point scoring? Okay, thoughts? <laughs> Sorry, I got emoed. Um, I personally, I think that uh, gimmicks are just. I think it. 
I'm sorry if I'm blunt here. I think gimmicks just insult the intelligence of the youth, honestly. Um, I mean, there are so many things that the youth are concerned about, just like what, you know, adults are co uh, similar to adults, you know, like um, the cost of living, housing, the job market and all that. And uh, yeah, so I think basically based on what I understand, based on what I read about what the WP does, I think, uh, you know, the, the WP aims to address these issues instead, you know, to focus on what the youth have, um, uh, the, the issues that the youth face. Lah. So, uh, I mean, there are also, you know, more youth specific um, uh, matters such as, you know, um, educational stress and all that, uh, which I mean, I think, James, you have talked about it, right? Uh, educational stress and exam stress. Yeah, but I keep putting myself through it, so it's not a, I'm not a good example. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, I think uh, just address, so basically a uh, short, uh, short answer is just address the matters that concern the youth, that's all. Can I please emphasize what Britain said, right? Uh, as a borderline young person, as a youth right now, <laughs> I, I find it incredibly cringe, for lack of a better term. Like, the government seems to think that, you know, uh, aligning itself with Taylor Swift and Swifties and playing guitar and all this appeals to the youth, youth voters. And I think that is, that is a genuine discredit to them and it kind of implies that they cannot think beyond all these personality politics and things that are meme-worthy. And to bring it back to your question earlier, uh, Swan, so it also, it, despite this being uh, an event organized by the WP, personally, I, I don't really care how you vote, as long as you vote and you vote properly and you vote with your conscience and you vote in what you think it serves in Singapore's best and Singapore's interest best. That is, that is, at the end of the day, how you should vote. And you shouldn't be influenced or swayed by someone who can play guitar or play some Taylor Swift song. It, it just, your vote is too important, too precious to, to be used in that way. What if I'm a single issue guitar voter? <laughs> Uh, actually, the, I think this is an interesting question to pose. If people, anyone in the audience have thoughts about uh, social media and whether you feel that this is something that uh, actually has traction with you? Uh, any, yeah, thoughts? I think this is not an issue that only affects us. Like uh, the recent uh, Harry's campaign, actually, they are using social media quite often to uh, engage in, uh, especially like Spanish. Over to anyone, but like you know, still younger generation. And considering the fact that like those uh, true like big of videos, for example, case like thousands of views, I think there is some merit to putting some like so called how do I say, like so called connecting with the views a little bit. But there is a certain limit to I think what um, how much they can go. Like for example, um, to see like you know. Um, there's a parliament doing like proper and many things. I think that's uh, okay, but like when they start to engage in like certain type of threats, for example, I think that's to a point where I like, hmm, maybe we should stop and go back a few steps to think like, is this really what we just want to see? Okay. Point noted. Do not do TikTok trends, but yes. <laughs> I guess the point I want to make is that it works, doesn't it? Like, I mean, I, maybe it hasn't worked yet. We don't have any empirical evidence that it works. But the thing is, if you're meeting voters where they are, I need to say on social media networks and, and with short form content, which is, which is really where it's moving towards now, you stand a better chance of being able to connect with them rather than saying, oh, this is bad and we shouldn't engage in it because it's beneath us. The point about convincing people to vote is that you have to meet them where they are. You can't set your own path and then, you know, you can't just expect people to come and engage with you. You have to meet them where they are. And I guess the question I would have personally is, are we moving towards a society or even just worldwide where elections are one based more on vibes than policy or are there still policy arguments to be made? I mean, if you look at the US, you know, you have Kamala campaigning, the youth coming out to camp campaign for Kamala on stuff like Brad Summer or being coconut pill or just calling the Republicans weird, which all, all of them are just vibes. They're not actual policy. It is based on policy, especially the weird one, but it's more vibes than policy based. And I don't know, if, I feel like if 
you are not willing to meet voters where they are, you know, you're not willing to meet them based on vibes and focus steadfastly on policy, it's a losing battle in the end of the day. Alright, uh, ju just as context, WEIR is also something that is used uh, as an acronym uh, for White Educated, can I spell? Uh, industrialized, rich, and democratic. So that's one reason why if you design policies only for weird voters, uh, then you are missing out on other segments of the population that you should be designing policies for. Other questions from the floor? Yes, uh, just one of these two. Yeah, we'll, we'll take them in turn. Hi, my name is Brian. Uh, so, I think all of you, thank you for sharing. I think all of you mentioned something about the, just the importance of having in general elections that were contested in the first place. So, can, I think just the blunt version is, well, if some election is called in like in three months from now to the end of next, to what the hard deadline mentioned earlier, do, do you all have plans with the rest or anything that we will actually get to vote in the elections because that there will be candidates to vote for wherever. Okay. So will there be candidates? So are you asking a question about um, uh, not having walkovers? I, yeah. I'm not sure whether that's what you mean. Yeah, yeah, I think so, yeah. Oh, okay. Um, of course, uh, WP is not in control of what other yeah. parties do, right? Uh, and we also are widely known to be quite conservative in the number of candidates that we field, you know, so we... Oh, we're I conservative think, in some way at least. Yeah, yes, <laughs> yes we are. And, um, and like for example, you know, for us to field 20-something candidates is kind of our norm in the last few elections, you know. So if you look at the number of seats, which is like 80 plus, you know, we're, we're not even at the quarter mark or whatever it is, huh? but we have to do the maths. So, um, but the good thing of course is that there are other parties, right? And uh, in the last one or two elections, I believe all the seats were contested, right? Because we managed to kind of decouple ourselves. Um, so, if you look at, uh, okay, so there is a mechanism that, okay, and this usually comes into play after the new boundaries are announced. Okay, so we don't know whether the boundary committee has been formed, we, we don't know when this announcement is going to be made, but as and when the report comes out and the boundaries are confirmed, then um, the, there will be a, a sort of a pan-opposition party meeting, you know, we will attend and then we will kind of indicate which are the areas we want to contest and we'll try to work it out such that no war is left uncontested and we try to avoid three-cornered fights as far as possible. It's not always possible, but that's what we try to do. Uh, and of course, whether all the seats will be contested depends a lot on whether people join, you know, opposition parties and whether, you know, the, the parties see fit to, to feel the candidates. So. Uh, it also depends on whether there's, I would say, growth uh, in the opposition parties. So, so there is a mechanism uh, to, to try to avoid uh, having uh, walkovers in, in, in certain wards. Okay, thank you. Uh, anyone else before? Okay, no? Okay, oh, well, I, 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 got, I see your hand, but yeah. Sure. Thank you. Uh, Sohail, soon to be first time GD voter, I'm younger than I look. Um, <laughs> so, no judgment, uh, no judgment. Sorry, right. thank you so much. Um, no, just, uh, uh, it was interesting just now when we were talking about the left right um, uh, spectrum, right? Uh, uh, but there's always something pragmatic about being a politician and trying to get votes. At the same time, you have your own values. So, at one end, perhaps you went in, especially for you, there's a lot of idealism a lot of uh, you know, desire to see the change you want, but society is not ready. So how do you balance your personal values and the need to win votes? Especially when you have sometimes issues, for example, sections 378, thankfully it's history now, but you know, those are issues that are societal issues that you yourself have personal strong values of, but you also need to win votes. How do you balance that need for personal values with the need to win? So the question is how to balance personal values against getting elected. That is a it's a very good question. Firstly, let me uh, let me say that, and the short answer is it's complicated. It kind of depends on you as an individual. 
uh, I don't want to speak on behalf of him, but the first time I, I sat down and met with Britta, uh, I explained there are a lot of things that the Workers' Party do that I don't really, personally, I, I don't really agree with or I don't really align with. But on the other hand, there are a lot of good things that come from the policies of the Workers' Party that push forward and improve the lives of Singaporeans. I think it's a value judgment that you have to make for yourself as an individual and see where you want to go with uh, the party. And the thing that Britain told me, right, is that as a, and, and this is a point that Sylvia mentioned earlier, as a responsible party, you kind of move with Singapore. So you kind of have to move towards that centrist block that appeals the most to uh, most Singaporeans. And I'll just end with this, my friend. Uh, my brother is a bit more liberal than, I have a twin brother, and he's a bit more liberal than myself. And he, he has issues with uh, certain policy positions of the party. And he thinks, oh, why they do this, why they do that. And I always tell him, right, you have to, you have to, you have to take it as a complete package. You, you can't just look at it in a very binary way where, oh, if, if, if the party doesn't do this, then it doesn't stand for me, it doesn't appeal to me. I think you have to make that judgment as an individual voter or an individual person yourself. So that's what I'll add to that conversation. Mutasim? You seem... No? no? Christian? Just looking down at his <laughs> shoes. Okay. No? Otherwise, we, we can take more questions. Uh, uh, yeah, back there. Uh, hello, I'm Evelyn. Um, before I ask my question, I would like to say one of the reasons why I came here. Uh, I came here because uh, I disagree with um, Green Party's position regarding censorship, specifically. Um, Wait, sorry, whose position? Uh, the ruling party. The ruling party. Um, um, regarding censorship, I wouldn't say it's a bad thing. I personally support censorship, but then I feel, the reason why I'm curious is because I feel that current po censorship policy is way too overarching and prohibitive. I think one example is the Sam Soy Woman cigarette fiasco. <laughs> That's probably one example. And I just, right now, that brings me to my question. Is Singapore ready for lighter censorship policies? Okay. Yes. Is Singapore ready for lighter censorship yes. policies? Be beyond uh, Yes. Maybe uh, one of the other two? Um, okay, you, your question was whether Singapore is ready. You know, maybe we should ask whether the government is ready. You know, and I mean, Singaporeans, I think, you know, over time, we have become very educated. Um, we can make up our own minds about things. So I don't see why we should fall back uh, uh, from uh, a lighter touch to, to those matters that you raised. Of course, the question is, is whether the government is ready for it. And of course, we know there are some topics where they are touchier than others, right? So this is a discussion that I think Singaporeans need to have with the government. But I think that on the whole, I have faith in Singaporeans being able to make their own decisions and judgment. Um, to answer your question, thank you very much for it, by the way. Um, yes, the, the answer is a resulting yes. Um, right now, what we are experiencing is a government that is far too concerned about every aspect of how we think. So, including our opinions on things, it's being shaped by that. So that is not something we should continue as a society. Uh, we should be able to, to think for ourselves especially when uh, the creative spaces are involved. This is how we express ourselves. If you allow like, a higher power or, or the authorities to, to dictate your every move, then um, it shows how afraid they are of, of, a, of a different perspective. It shows how patronizing they are as well. And I think that is not the right way for, for any party to, to lead a country because uh, it basically tells us that they don't have trust in us, they don't have enough trust in us. So yes, we, we are ready for a lighter um, series of censorship laws. So I just wanted to add that my own sense is that sometimes the people in the chain self-censor, okay, they kind of think that, oh, this person won't be happy if I report this thing, so I'm going to edit it myself, you know, and self-censor. So, so I think we should have less of that, and, and for that we need everybody to push the boundaries because if you don't do it, then you know, it just becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. So um, it may not be fair to totally blame the government for this because it could be a cultural thing. You know? So I think that we all need to examine ourselves 
um, how we can actually uh, move the needle on, on this issue. Yeah, uh, I think firstly, thank you for your question. Uh, so I think my, my answer is a bit simpler. Um, yes, I would like to think that we are a bit, <coughs> we are a bit more, uh, well, uh, we, are, we are a bit more receptive to the lesser censorship, especially since a lot of us uh, consume a lot more content from uh, further afield from the, uh, through the internet and all that uh, compared to last time. So uh, I think we are a bit more exposed to you know different ideas, uh, different ways of living, different ways of thinking. Uh, and I and I think you know the government should no longer con uh, control you know what people view and and all that. Uh, yeah. So I'm gonna next question. I'm gonna revert back to a pre-submitted question, and I think this is something useful not just for the panelists to opine on, but actually for others in this room to share. This brings us back to youths. The question is, uh, what more can be done to get youths uh, more interested in uh, political developments and the political context? So how do we get greater youth involvement in politics, if you will? And the youth will speak. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it says political context, but I, I, it can be, it, it, of, of course, policy is a part of politics, so feel free to broaden the scope of the question, and we can just mm -hmm. keep, uh, yeah, go ahead. Um, firstly, thank you to whoever submitted that question. Uh, I think that personally, okay, so I think I'll just uh, talk about my grand, grandfather's story. Lah. So uh, basically, how I got how I got interested in politics was not you know through I think more well established means such as you know uh, model United Nations and all that I mean I I just talk politics with my father at the dining table that's all I did um, and I do think that through such um, you know whether it is at at meal time or for some of you maybe at the smoking corner. Uh, you know, you just discuss, you know, issues of the day and and just, you know, share how, you know, how the things that affect our lives, like, you know, you know our jobs, uh, maybe, you know, oh, the exam was too tough. How, it is, how is it linked to policy? How is it linked to, you know, our educational policy? Why is it structured like that? And I think that would help us as you or you know people who are not so deeply involved in politics to gain a better understanding of it and to become and to become much more uh, savvy uh, savvy voters yeah others um, speaking from my experience personally uh, because I volunteer mainly in Serangoon um, because of the because when Leon was there, the profile of volunteers we had were kind of younger in general. I would say the question is interesting, um, but there is a distinction between what we do. Uh, not everything we do is political. So I think if you if you are a young person, you want to give back to your community, you want to do a bit of volunteering. It usually starts by them coming to our MPS, putting a few hours here and there, doing a bit of food distribution. And I think over time they see the direction the party is moving towards. They see the motives of the people that they volunteer with. And they, they see that affinity with the party's policies and eventually they will also chime in and, and, and share their thoughts as a young person and say, yeah, this is how I want to contribute to the party that way. Yeah, so volunteering is, is very important, I would say. Uh, this allows you to have a broader perspective of things that happen on the ground. And uh, as a youth, this is, some, this is an opportunity that, that you should take up. Uh, as much as you can. Um, that's not to say that the older folks shouldn't volunteer as well. It's not a youth-specific thing, but it's, uh, it's an activity that is good for your, for, for your critical mind. Um, another thing I, that I think is important that will help our younger generations be more proactive in the national development is to have more open conversations, be it you know, face-to-face -face or in schools. This is where institutions come in. 
um, there should be a promotion of of open discussions regarding policies, whether it's a national policy or a grassroots policy. I think this will allow them to be to to open their eyes as to what is happening. Because the paragraph paraphrase uh, a saying, you may not care about politics, but politics will care about you. So whether you if, even if you, you you pose a question to your friend, or rather if your friend asks a question to you, hey, what do you think about X Y Z policy? And you, if you respond, oh no, I'm not political. Uh, I don't have any thoughts. You know, I don't really care about it. I think that is a is a fundamentally flawed uh, way of thinking, and that's something that we should change first and foremost before we move on. Um, as a as a citizen, especially when you when you step out of the door, you are already faced with the 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 effects of politics and the policies. So you have to, to take that first step, discuss it with friends, talk about it, debate about it if you want, of course, without resorting to punching each other. Um, and then uh, in, in, uh, in other environments, let's say in your school clubs, and I know that some universities have like uh, Singapore affairs related um, uh, societies that you can join. Join them. Then uh, have, have very frank discussions, organize forums such as this one, um, if it's an open door discussion, even better because people don't feel like they are being, they're, they're not being uh, closed off by gatekeepers. This is how you encourage people to, to be braver and and more inspired to, to make a change, even if it's a small one. Well, we, the room is in fact a select group you have selected to come here. So in, in principle, you will all be a little more interested in politics. So I'm happy for you guys to Contribute. How do you think, uh, as youths, you can uh, political processes can be more interesting for you? Anyone has thoughts? Yeah, please. Uh. I, um. So, I was thinking that one way for the youth to be more politically involved uh, links back to social media, because in a way, politics is narrative, right? And yeah, vibes. So I think by creating parasocial relationships with the youth, you know, through like the edits and all that, the youth see, begin to see themselves as like an, as part of the narrative, and then they have a more vested interest in actually participating. I think that those are just my thoughts on it. Yeah, I don't have much to elaborate on. I also have some thoughts. So I feel like personally for me as a youth, like I would, I think as growing up, right, um, one thing that they could change to help youth be more political, politically involved is like the education. Because I think in general, youth want like a freedom of expression, freedom of speech. And a lot of times you don't really have that freedom and that space to go and learn. Because everything here is very limited. Like the resources are limited, people are limited. So I think in that sense, like, um, yeah, like just improving the education in that sense, giving us a space and environment where we can express ourselves and grow our own um, desires and dreams. I mean, like it's not very practical in terms of the Singapore context, but I feel like Singapore is at a stage where they are mature enough to develop that freedom and speech to uh, dream and have their own ambitions. Um, yeah. Uh, I will hand you the mic. Uh, I really like where this dis discussion has been going because uh, I might be the youngest here. I'm still in junior college. So uh, I'm here because I want to look at how we can engage the youth side because I'm also part of the history and current affairs club. So I've been thinking about this question all day and uh, since the start of the year. So I was, this, some of the things that we are trying to do is like starting a newsletter and we have talked with our teacher in charge and they have said, oh, you can write about anything you want. So I'll, I like when, when people say that, oh, uh, the youth have maybe a, a, a propensity towards talking about what they feel like they want to talk about and so we've been trying to give that platform. And on what has actually been happening, I, I fully support things that have been done, like pre use seminar um, that has been an initiative that's been going on. and having like Ministry of Foreign Affairs coming to our school to talk about these issues and I've been trying, I've been seeing the effects of that and I, I want to see more of that. Yeah. Yeah, 
I, uh, again, I'm not that young. <laughs> but um, I just want to add on to what the gentleman said, that uh, social media can be an avenue for engaging the youth. I mean, personally, uh, I, I became woke after watching a lot of YouTube videos of Noam Chomsky, Robert Wright. So uh, on the part of uh, politicians like yourself, uh, maybe you can use social media to explain uh, policies and how it affects the average Singaporean's uh, life. Okay. Can I can yeah. I just jump in here and try to address the, yep. the collective questions that have been asked already? Right. I think there is a distinction to be made within uh, with engaging you, especially if you're in opposition politics. Mm -hmm. I take everything you guys say on board. I think you're right. Social media is important. The thing is. And I can share my frank, frank and candid experience, right? There are many youths that come through me and they come and see, oh, this is what opposition politics is like. And they look at it and it doesn't have the, the glamour and the gloss and the sheen that social media has. And they realize, actually, this is not for me. And that's fine. That's perfectly fine as well. It is a bit harder for us as opposition, uh, bothering with opposition, when people come to MBS and they realize, oh, we don't have any air conditioned officers. Uh, you know, we don't actually have that savvy or that, um, that savvy or that that um, viral social media network to engage with. There is that consideration for us um, when we want to engage you, let's say, with social media. It's not that we don't want to, we just have some structural challenges. Um, there, but it's a reality that we're trying to overcome. I think I interrupted. Uh, That's fine, sir. Um, regarding uh, how um, groups, in, uh, basically political parties in general, uh, such as the opposition, can, uh, uh, can give a greater say, basically can engage with youth more often. Um, I would say that social media is important, but in the end, social media is just a medium, uh, a way for you to communicate. But I think one way for you to engage with youth is very simple. Make youth part of something bigger. That's probably uh, something that will help engage youth. If they know they're being part of something that is bigger, something that can change Singapore or something, then people will be motivated to take action. People will be motivated to participate more. Um, yeah, so it's very, basically very simple. Make, um, try to make you part of something bigger. Okay. Uh, more thoughts? Yes. Sorry, this is a bit of a different topic, but uh, so I found something, uh, what I found very interesting in what the panel discussed just now is the idea of self censorship and how that's kind of the narrative from the ruling party that our stability comes from self-censorship. So my question is kind of just, you know, how can we as youths kind of stop that self-censorship that stops us from having you know, interesting conversations with you know, other youths and to really think about you know, opposition as a, I don't know, sorry, I don't know how to end my question, sorry. Oh, that's okay. The uncles at the coffee shops have no problem now. But... <laughs> uh, the panelists, do, do people have thoughts about self censorship? How to unself censor? He's self censoring right now. Testing. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, so, uh, firstly, uh, I think thank you uh, to the both of you for your um, really wonderful statements and questions. Um, I think that, firstly, as a youth volunteering in an opposition party, um, I mean, uh, like Jackson mentioned, it is certainly not glamorous, but it is meaningful. It and you know, nothing good ever comes easy, lah. Honestly, <laughs> you know, it's I'm doing. I'm not just just doing it for myself. I am doing it for my um, for my future generations. You, you know, I I, yeah. So that is that is why I am doing this. And at least personally, I feel that I'm being part of some. I'm part of something bigger. And on your question on on your topic of uh, self censorship, I do think that personally, when I try to um, engage in politics with another, with someone else, I try to do it with instead of self censoring. What I do is I try to phrase whatever I say in a more you know, uh, in a in a more empathetic way. And at, at least I also personally try to understand the other person's uh, point of view. And even if you know, we disagree, it's, it's fine, I'm at, I'm at peace uh, with, you know, what I believe in, that's all. 
I, I would actually like to know the panel's opinion on the GRC system in Singapore, which is very unique actually. I have not seen this anywhere else in the world. Does it really favor the ruling party always because in the last GE, as we saw, one GRC actually doubled the opposition MP count in the parliament? I don't know which one that would be, but uh, <laughs> some thoughts about GRC systems. Sure, I'll take this first then. Um, I think it's, the GRC system is quite unique in, in terms of electoral systems. Uh, I mentioned this earlier as part of the panel, but, but we actually have the most MPs, uh, sorry, the lowest MP per capita for most major parliamentary democracies. When you look at, when you look at the, uh, Taiwan, they have 200,000 individuals to one MP. And in Singapore, that figure is around 60,000. So it begins the question, right, of why do you need so many MPs, first of all, and why do you need this convoluted GRC system to be overlaid on top of everything? I understand the government's uh, rationale in progressing it. I do think that times may have changed a bit, and it doesn't, it, it doesn't serve the purpose it, is, it was intended to, uh, I'll just put it that way, at the risk of, uh, at the risk of persecution. And one thing I'll add uh, to conclude, right, about this GRC system, I think the government or the government is also realizing that it is the sort that they will live and die by. If they win big with GRCs, they will also lose big with GRCs when they lose them. And that's why you see a scaling down of GRCs from six-man, five-man GRCs to, I think, something more uh, appropriate. I'll put it that way. Um, so this is an old issue. Um, I think the GRCs were introduced first in the 1988 general election. And from that time, uh, till 2011, how long is, is that? 98, 08, 20 over years. Lah. Um, no opposition party was able to, to win any GRC. Uh, and, and it is simply because uh, for smaller parties, right, it's harder to have the required combination of candidates uh, because, simply because we have fewer candidates. So for instance, say I've got two very promising candidates, right? Um, and we need to feel a GRC. I have to find that minority candidate, otherwise nobody can run. So in that sense, it is at the expense of smaller parties because if you do not have the passport, meaning that minority candidate, and it's gazetted whether this area is Malay or this area is Indian, uh, if you don't have the required, uh, Indian and others, sorry, so if you don't have the required person to become the passport, the whole team is just out. So for smaller parties, this has always been a disadvantage. And um, we also are, are not uh, convinced about the fact that if we had a system of single seats, that we would really uh, have no minority MPs in Parliament. We don't believe that this is the case. And we have case examples in history that show that, you know, uh, for example, minority candidates could win in a predominantly Chinese constituency, for example. So we don't believe that Singaporeans vote primarily because of race, right? So, so, so this has always been an issue. But in 2011, that was the first time that uh, a GRC fell to, to Workers' Party uh, that was in our unit. But I have to say, being part of that team, that it was a combination of very special factors at that time. Uh, and not so easy to replicate. Of course, we can talk about what happened in 2020, which is a different story altogether. But um, in general, there are disadvantages to smaller parties because of this. Some voters don't like it because maybe I like these two people, but I hate this third person. You know, then what are you going to do with the other team? <laughs> you know, um, but of course, uh, the other complication is about gerrymandering. So, the voting patterns uh, in different precincts are known to parties that participate because we each have our counting agents. We know this area, what was the percentage for this party, that party, and so on. So. So we don't know how this factors into the boundary redrawing, you know, uh, but our sense is that uh, it's not so easy to win single seats now because I can just draw a single seat anywhere I like, you know, the boundaries committee, you, you sort of can't appeal against the, tr the, the, the announcement of the boundaries. So there is a lot of potential for gerrymandering and I would say in the ruling party's favour. So, um, so this sometimes makes the argument that single seats are easier to win. It's not so clear to us now because of this gerrymandering complication. So right now, I would say that um, although we don't like it, I mean, opposition parties, if we can get the 
uh, resources to fill in GRCs, we will, because this is the game that, that these are the rules of the game that are, are being drawn up by the ruling party, and we, we have had some limited success in that. You know, um, so I would say that overall, we don't believe that this is necessary, you know, but of course, voters may have a different view, but whatever it is, we will just play by the rules. As an academic, I feel it's important for me to at least explain gerrymandering for those who are less familiar with the term. If you have ever wondered why uh, Upper Serangoon happens to be in Marine Parade GRC when you cannot see the sea, uh, that that is a strange shape. Uh, that shape was named after the first uh, governor that shaped this, Governor Eldri Elbridge Jerry, and how his constituency looked like a, a salamander. So that's what the origins of that word. Not more information than you probably needed to know. Yeah. So, so more information than you needed to know. Uh, another question here? Yeah. Uh, we had a question about the voting age. So we understand that um, for your 2020 manifesto, you are looking into reducing the voting age to 18. Uh, how do you feel that would benefit our democracy or affect our democracy in any way? Okay, as an older person, I want to answer this question. <laughs> because I've been harping on this issue for, since I think in Parliament since 2007 or 2008, um, because at that time, I was already beginning to realize that we are actually an outlier, you know, if you look at international benchmarks. And at that time already, which is like, how many years ago is that? Huh? Like seven? Oh, eight, don't know, so many years. Sixteen years ago, around there. So we have routinely tested on that. <laughs> yeah, so at that time already, you know, we, we saw that many countries had moved their voting age. Eighteen is very common in most countries. You have some countries that are even lower, you know, like 16 or something like that, but we were one of the few countries at that time that was 21. And one of the compelling arguments I found was that if you look at what happened in the USA when they, in the 60s when they moved the voting age from uh, 21 to 18, was that youths age 18 and above were being drafted to fight in Vietnam, all right? And and this, this, this movement came on to say that uh, if I'm old enough to die, I'm old enough to vote, you know, like, wh why, why should there be a difference, right? So, that was the impetus for the change in the US, and if you look in Singapore's context, it applies equally. If, if you look at the age at which uh, men are being drawn into national service, it's the same thing, right? So, if you're old enough to fight, fight you're old enough to vote. Okay, so, so I feel that, and, and I mean, our party takes that position still, um, and, and we feel that this is a very important um, change, uh, number one, to bring us into, uh, into step with, with international norms, and number two, it will empower the youth to actually start thinking about the future of Singapore earlier. You know, to know that you have a chance to, to have your voice heard at the ballot box at an earlier age will make you think about uh, issues affecting the, the country at an earlier age. So we think all round, um, it will benefit society as a whole. And, and the other thing which you might want to think about is there's, there's a lot of, there's some anomalies when it comes to the age at which you can do a lot of things. Like 18 is the age at which you can drink, drive, not together, but drink, <laughs> and you can drive, and you can be a director of a company. So if you think about the responsibility of a company director, I mean, or you fiduciary duties and all that, is that much simpler than voting. I, I, I mean, so, so do think about it. I mean, I don't think the government has a good answer. They just keep saying, voting is a very serious matter. You know, you, you must be mature enough to vote. But then, you know, if you're mature enough to do many other things, I mean, I think it's a, it's a shallow answer. And once again, as an academic, I feel it's my role to point out that studies actually show uh, that there is no evidence that the presence of youth voting uh, alters the overall political disposition uh, of, the, of the outcomes. So youths are just as likely, they, they, they care about different things, but they're just as likely to take uh, the vote in a very, very serious manner, in the way that it was intended. Uh, do we have any more questions? I'm just sensitive to the time. Okay, so, uh, just one back here, and then, yeah. We Uh, okay, I'm, hello everyone, I'm Mu Yuan. Um, 
So the question asked, so just now, I think someone mentioned that uh, democracies can only work when the leaders and policies like change frequently. I just want to verify if that's true. No? Okay, uh, okay, we'll move on to the next one. <laughs> okay, I have like three questions. I'll ask one because uh, because of time. Um, okay, so something else mentioned was that um, that the party that is trying to be voted in needs to make promises and get a make have a path to get there in five years. So and that there should be experts that to back up these claims. So then the question is, should we have technocrats uh, instead of just politicians uh, in the parliament? And uh, is five years sufficient for a party to carry out the policies that it's trying to portray or would uh, a plan that says, uh, for example, last 10 years, uh, assuming that you can actually maintain the majority for the next term, also be something that should be like available and um, that, like, that, that should be in the manifesto, for example. Yeah, thank you. Should parliament be comprised of technocrats? <laughs> so he, he, break, he grabbed the mic and passed it on. <laughs> I think that's for the voters to decide, right? I mean, you can feel a team of some technocratic people and see how that goes. Um, and of course, I mean, uh, I, I think you need to find some balance somewhere, you know, of people who can connect to the ground and then at the same time also be supported by people who actually can crunch numbers and things like that. So. Uh, each party will have to decide, and the voters have to decide. You know what kind of combination they like. Um, the other, the other question, which is quite interesting, is about whether elections should have a longer cycle. Um, I don't know whether y'all will accept voting once every ten years. You know, um, and, and uh, I think five years is kind of normal in most Westminster systems. You will see this kind of time frame. I think Australia is three years. You know, which is, which some people think is too short. Yeah. So. Um, but in the end, it's all about convincing the people, if you're in power, that you're, you're moving in the right direction and hopefully people will vote rationally and let you continue. So I think we have to trust democracy. There's no better option. So with regards to the answers about uh, whether we should feel technocrats or politicians, it's not binary. You need to have a good mix because you need people. Some people are not, um, I would say, as fluent in terms of connecting uh, on a on a ground level. They, they are behind the scenes doing all the number crunching, like what Sophia has mentioned. Uh, so we need a good balance of that. Uh, at the end of the day, the voters have the final choice. Uh, with regards to the feasibility of uh, policies that you present and whether they can be done in five years, I think it is not, it is my opinion, I may be in direct opposition with some people here, but I think that five years is a good aim, but it's not necessary because you are laying the foundations of a set of policies. You are laying the foundation of um, certain things that you want to do and no, things happen. Five years will definitely be quite short, especially if it's a national, a national issue or a project that you want to do on a national scale. But what you are essentially doing is you are telling people this is what the party is moving towards, and this is what we are going to do. And if you believe in the logic behind it, then by all means, please uh, rally behind us. Uh, five years. 10 years, it may take even longer than that, but as long as you are sharing the same same uh, thought process, you want to achieve that goal eventually, I think that is, that is already a good start. So we have time for one last question. It's, uh, the uh, yeah, the gentleman over there. And then we will, uh, I'll wrap up with the fi final thoughts from each of them. Yeah, so, so my question is uh, regarding uh, ideological partnership. Yeah, We've heard uh, in many avenues where Workers' Party has told that you know they don't have enough candidates to field uh, in multiple constituency. Um, so is there a possibility, because Singapore doesn't allow uh, post-poll alliances, uh, we only have people. So is there a possibility where 
I know not not in the immediate elections, but you know in future, where there can be a constituency where you know candidates from Workers Party and an opposition party can stand together, uh, if they can find a middle ground in in ideology. The reason why I'm asking this is you know there is a lot of support that there can be a lot of support for Workers Party in constituencies where they don't field candidates. Yeah. And so people feel that you know they have been left out, and you know they still want to support Workers Party, and they want their voices to be heard. So is is that a possibility which Workers Party has thought through? Uh, we're not considering that at the moment uh, because um, it's not that we uh, are isolationists in that sense, but it's just the practicality of the whole thing, uh, and and we are also very conscious uh, of the fact that. Uh, you see, WP actually has been around now for 60... Do this a maths lesson. 67 years. 67 years, all right? We are, we are, besides the PAP, we are the, the only opposition party that was formed before independence that is active in elections today. And that branding has been built up over a long period of time. We have supporters who um, are, are still uh, wanting WP to progress further. So. We are quite concerned about any brand dilution, you know, because we have built it up and, and there is brand recognition. In fact, some years ago there was a, a press survey, I think it was conducted by Zhao Bao, the Chinese Daily, some years back about brand recognition of political parties. So of course, the PAP brand with the lightning is very well recognized, almost 100% recognition in the people's survey. But for WP, it was about 94% recognition. So for us to, to dilute that, I think there is an electoral, there's a cost to us. Uh, at the same time also, uh, any alliance will, will bring in questions about, okay, so uh, whose agenda do we adopt? Uh, how are we going to go about, what are the issues to canvas at the election? Who's going to, you know, who's going to lead? You know, so there are some of these uh, unnecessary complications we find. So at the moment, we're still focused on, on building up our party. Of course, in the distant future, I don't rule it out because we never know how Singapore politics will change. But currently, our focus is still very much uh, based on building up the party and offering voters a choice based on our own branding. I won't add much more to what Sylvester said to that, but I, one thing I'll say as a, as a voter and not as a party party, right, is that how would you feel if, if for the Workers' Party, right, walking around and being in the constituencies that we, that we compete in is synonymous with our party, right? How would you feel if all of a sudden there's a WP contingent somewhere in the West where we don't really walk that often? I, I don't think it's that compelling to voters per se, just because our brand is as good as Sylvia mentioned. Okay, I'm sensitive to the time. Uh, of course, everyone... Okay, one last question, it seems... I, I'm a, such a push Thank you. <laughs> Okay, I want to address here. I personally believe that both the Workers' Party and the PAP have played their part in shaping Singapore. Like, there is good impact in everything. So, to what extent do you agree that PAP has done good despite being an opposing party? Despite being an opposing despite party? Us being a, not, not that they are the opposing party, but... Uh, yeah. Okay, I mean, to be fair, I, I think I can say that uh, the PAP has shown competence as a government, you know, over the decades. But at the same time, I always feel that the narrative is always about them. But what about the people, you see? I mean, you know, they can't do anything if the people don't rise to the occasion, right? So we have to give Singaporeans credit too, you know, for building Singapore to what it is today. You know, the ruling party has its part in, in doing some steering and so on and, and implementing the correct policies, but it's the people who have risen to the occasion. So, you know, I mean, let's give credit where credit is due. Very good. Okay. <laughs> On that note, so I'm just going to ask the panelists, uh, this is one of the pre-submitted questions, so I'm just going to ask the panelists in one sentence for each of these questions to answer, and I think it's a nice way to round up uh, the discussion since this is a panel voting. The question is, firstly, what does it mean to vote? And secondly, what are we actually voting for? And I already prepped Christian, so he will take the first questions and we'll move down the line. Okay. Uh, so I think personally, um, I think we are, uh, us as voters, we are all stakeholders in this country. And I think we all need to have a say in where we want the country to move forward for, you know, the next 
uh, five, ten years, forever. So, um, yeah, that is that is why we we vote. Uh, you know, to have to have a say in where we want our country, our our home to uh, progress towards, and what we want our and yeah, what we want from our leaders and our government. Okay, a lot of commas in that sentence. <laughs> So, <laughs> what does it mean to vote, and what are we actually voting for? What does it mean to vote, and what are we voting for? Okay. The whole thing is me, um, a way to express myself and to essentially tell the government uh, how well they are doing, and and also to, to say that I am not convinced, or I'm convinced uh, with their policies, and I want to try something else the next round. And uh, it, it goes the same for the policies as well. Uh, what am I voting for? Well, I'm voting for my future. That is the gist of it. If, if you want a longer answer, I'm voting for my future and ensuring that it will be a brighter one where my, my interests and what I stand for are being represented properly in Parliament. Great. So, yeah. Uh, what does it mean to vote? Uh, I would say that it's your duty to vote as a citizen. And uh, what what do you hope to see? Is it? What are you What are you actually voting for? What you're voting for? You're voting for the society that you want to see. Jackson? <clears throat> voting is the single most important thing that you can do as a citizen. It's your civic duty. So please make your vote count. Alright, so on that note, thank you to all the panelists once again. And thank you for joining us on this uh, slightly drizzly, it hasn't been raining for a while, so it's nice that it finally did uh, Sunday afternoon. Uh, there are, as promised, uh, refreshments over there, uh, as well as water, soft, uh, sugary drinks. Uh, I guess the panelists will also remain and mingle Please feel free to remain and mingle a little bit, uh, and we'll, we're always hope, open to taking additional questions. So, thank you very much once again.